Hi, uh, this is Community Conversations. Welcome, glad to have you here. Um, my name is Courtney Shaw. I'm the facilitator of the, of the series, and I want to let you know that we have this week's, we have next week, Michael Strayer is going to be presenting, and you're not going to want to miss that. Michael is our uh, legendary Community Conversations presenter. Then we have the week off for Thanksgiving. Please don't come here on Thanksgiving. There will be nobody here and the doors will be locked. And then we have one final event on December 1st. Uh, somebody named Courtney Shaw, I think is giving that one. Yeah. So you might wanna to come to that if, you, if, you, if you're into that kind of thing. Anyway, I am very pleased to welcome a new speaker to our series here. Uh, Joanna Mosser taught at Drake University, go Bulldogs, in Des Moines, Iowa for 12 years before coming to LCC in the fall of 2018. She teaches courses in US politics, world politics and political theory, and is currently working on her first book about the presence and role of politics in our everyday lives. Please welcome Joanna Mosser. Well, thank you, Courtney. Can everyone hear me okay? No. Okay. They need to stand over here. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you, Courtney. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I, I'm a political scientist, and I find voting and elections really animating and energizing, but I understand that some of us might be feeling a little bit wary, a little bit weary after Tuesday, so I'm very happy to see you all here and to see your willingness to continue the conversation. So what I would like to do today is to offer some perspective as a political scientist and to offer some perspective on democracy. So we won't be talking about the election in particular, but I want to talk about that broader thing that the election is a part of, and that's democracy. So we're going to talk a little bit about what democracy is from a, from a political science perspective. What is democracy all about? We'll think a little bit about how we're doing both in the United States and globally. We'll talk a little bit about the, some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of uh, democracy in the United States. And then we'll talk about ways to build a democratic practice beyond the election. So what is democracy? When political scientists talk about democracy, they're really interested in the underlying value. So looking past the vote, looking past elections, really thinking about some of the animating underlying values of democracy. And, and democracy as an ethic is a really radical ethic and practice historically and comparatively. And it's animated first and foremost by this idea that no one because of a circumstance of birth is inherently superior or inferior, that there's no such thing as people who are born to rule and those who are born to be ruled. It's animated by this idea of affected interest. It's a really radical principle that if you are affected by a decision, a norm, a practice, or a law, you have a presumptive right to participate in authoring that thing. This is a potentially really expansive ethic, the idea that if you're affected, you should have a say in authoring that thing. And the third animating idea of democracy is this idea of the majority, that there's presumptive wisdom in what the people think and presumptive wisdom in what most people think. Now, if you take a look at this list, you might be thinking, gosh, we haven't really approximated any of these things in practice, and you'd be correct. If we looked historically, this idea of radical formal equality of affected interest, what we've seen instead historically are patterns of exclusion. Maybe over time, we've seen this sort of upward trajectory, especially in the, in the United States, but it's sort of an up and down upward trajectory. If the overall trajectory is up, we see some ups and downs in that trajectory. When it comes to majoritarianism as well, in the United States, it might, have, it might surprise you to hear this, but the, the framers of the US Constitution were not terribly big fans of democracy. Uh, they, they doubted the presumptive wisdom of the people and they put into the Constitution a tremendous number of checks on the role of the majority's voice in politics. So we can think here about just the system of checks and balances, that distribution of power among the legislative, judicial, and executive. We could think about the structure of Congress, especially the division of power between a House of Representatives that was directly elected by the people. It was in, intended to be the people's chamber, but it was checked by the power of the Senate which initially was selected by state legislatures, not by the people directly. And the Senate was intended to have sort of a cooling effect 
on the preferences and interests of the house. And we can think about the Bill of Rights too, as a sort of, this is gonna sound sort of strange, but scholars talk about it as having a sort of anti-democratic aim in the sense that it's intended to check the ability of a majority to get what it wants. If you think about the provisions of the Bill of Rights, it's a restraint on majority preference. Even if lots of people want a particular thing, the Bill of Rights says you can't do that particular thing. So when folks like me as a political scientist, when we think about democracy, what we're, what we're looking at is sort of the, the health of democracy and we're using a bunch of indicators. And I'm not gonna go through each of these things in detail because I want us today to think about democracy in a different way. But as a political scientist, um, I'm really interested in tracking the democratic health of particular political communities over time. I'm interested too in doing a little bit of comparison. How well is democracy doing in this particular place versus that particular place? And so formal checklists like this give me a lot of traction in my study. It allows me to look for particular indicators of the democratic health of a particular community. Now, what you're gonna see up here is an awful lot of reference to checks, limits on power, accountability, and that's really central to democracy. Yeah. Is there a way to, to remove that? There we go. Okay. So based on this formal checklist, and again, political scientists like me use this to try to, to, to understand and track the democratic health of particular political communities and to do a little bit of cross-country comparison. And you might be wondering, as you look at that list of formal indicators, how's the world doing? How is democracy doing globally? Any, any initial impressions? So not terribly well, um, not terribly well. So if, if we look globally, what's fascinating is that democracy, the, the idea and the word itself has become sort of a non-optional self-descriptor of choice for countries. So countries will strain to define themselves as democratic. The word, the idea has become sort of non-optional in politics, but many countries fall quite short of that list of formal indicators that I just shared with you. So what you're looking at here is uh, some research by an organization called Freedom House. And the work of Freedom House is especially helpful to me as a political scientist because they're the ones who collect ground level data that allows us to rate particular political communities and their democratic health. So what you're seeing in this chart is, a, is about a 15, 16 year period of decline in the democratic, in, in the health of democracy globally. So what you can see here is that in the past 16 years, more countries have declined in their democratic health than have gained or improved in their democratic health. And eight in 10 people across the world live in a country that is formally classified as partly free or not free. So what we're seeing over time, according to Freedom House, is this slow drift away from democratic norms and practices and more toward author authoritarian norms and practices. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. You might be wondering how the US is doing. So overall, we're seeing this sort of uh, what scholars call democratic decline or democratic backsliding or a, a democratic deficit. The US unfortunately has been downgraded as well in its democratic health. So we've made a top 25 list. Unfortunately, it's probably not a top 25 list that we wanna be on. It's a, the United States is in, right at the bottom there. It's the green bar at the bottom with the minus 10. So this is a list of the, the top 25 countries that have experienced the most significant declines in their democratic health in the last 10 years. And so the US, if you see on the bottom right there, I've got our, our, our score, formal score at, by, issued by the Freedom House is an 83 out of 100. Now that's a, that's a B, B minus respectable, uh, but it's, it's a significant downgrade from even two, three years prior where the grade was an, an A minus. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why today. So formal indicators are really great for someone who does research like, like me in democracy, but as a political scientist, I am just as interested, if not more interested in how real people experience the work and the practice of democracy. 
And some of these indicators up here, do they express some of your feelings prior to the election, perhaps even today? There might be a few more things that we want to add to the list here, but it's a combination of hope, feelings of hopelessness, feelings of, of discomforts, feelings of disengagement, indifference, even fear. So formal indicators are really important, but for me, what I focus on as a political scientist is everyday indicators, people's actual lived experience of democracy. And in fact, if we look at those everyday indicators of experience, we're also seeing some symptoms of decline. So 59% of Americans express little to no confidence in the public's political wisdom. And that's up from 42% in 2007. 78% of Americans believe that knowledge is essential to democracy but only 39% say that this characterizes the American public even somewhat well. 73% of Americans say that Democrats and Republicans not only disagree over plans and policies, but also cannot agree on basic facts. 85% of Americans believe that the tone and nature of political debate in the country has become more negative. And 76% of Americans say that the nature and tone of political debate is less fact-based than it used to be. 85% say that it's less respectful than it used to be. And 60% say that it's less focused on issues and problems than it used to be. In 1958, 74% of the American public expressed trust in government. In 2020, just 17%. And partisan disagreement is increasingly expressed in personal terms. So 55% of Republicans say that Democrats are more immoral than other Americans. And 47% of Democrats say the same thing about Republicans. And that's a pretty significant increase from even just a few years ago. Do any of these things surprise you? Seeing, I'm seeing lots of head shaking. Here's some other warning signs. So 79% of poll workers who were surveyed back in April of 2021 say that they feel unsafe and they want government provided security in order to do their jobs. About 12% in a nation representative survey that was conducted back in 2021, about 12% of people indicated a willingness to engage in threat or intimidation to achieve a political aim. And among those who self-reported a willingness to undertake support or excuse political violence, they're not on average lone wolves. They're people who, who uh, report membership in community groups, whether they're physical groups or virtual groups that echo their ideas. Also in a nationwide population representative survey conducted back in earlier this year in 2022, 40% of respondents agreed that having a strong leader for America is more important than having a democracy. 36% of American adults believe that the traditional American way of life is disappearing so fast that we may have to use force to save it. And 16% of Americans say that army rule would be a good or a very good thing. And that's up from 6% in 1995. And you might think 16% is not a terribly large number, but that's about 30 million people. So the big question here is what's going on? And as a political scientist, you know, I, I, I follow and use those formal indicators that research issued by Freedom House, but I'm really interested in how actual people experience the work, the practice of democracy. And what's going on has an awful lot to do with trust and especially the decline of trust. So democracy, it might, it might surprise you to, to hear this from a political scientist, but we can, democracy generates disappointment necessarily, sort of by definition. Democracy is a procedural guarantee for all affected interests, all affected interests have a presumptive right to participate in, in this, this experiment of collective self-governance. It's a procedural guarantee rather than a guarantee of a particular outcome. And so people are designed to be disappointed. It produces frustration. It produces sacrifice or makes some sacrifice for the good of the whole. It guarantees losses 
hopefully sometimes some wins, but a loss is guaranteed. So democracy is a really big ask. And I like this work by a political scientist by the name of Danielle Allen. She wrote a book called Talking to Strangers. And Danielle Allen says democracy is a really incredible thing because it involves a large group of diverse strangers jointly agreeing to surrender their fates to one another. We collectively make a decision. We give power to some to make decisions in the best interests of everyone. That's an incredible thing. The democracy is an incredible experiment. It generates loss, it generates frustration and disappointment, and it requires trust to do this. I can't jointly agree to surrender my fate, my interests, my preferences to a bunch of others, unless I fundamentally trust those others to use their power in ways that fundamentally respect my interests and my preferences. So that big leap in faith requires trust. So you might think about a time or a, a relationship or a situation in which you felt trust. In situations of uncertainty, where we're not quite sure what's going to happen, trust is sort of that necessary social glue that allows us to make a leap in the context of the unknown. There's a psychologist by the name of Rachel Botsman, and she describes trust as a confident relationship to the unknown. And I sort of like this. We can't remove uncertainty. Uncertainty is a fact. We can't remove risk, but we can sort of cushion that feeling of anxiety that comes along with acting in the unknown. And when I can fundamentally trust that even if I lose the power holders that, you know, the folks who get power are still going to use their power in ways that respect my basic interests, I might be inclined to relax a little bit feel a little bit more comfort in that risk that democracy involves. So when trust is present in a democracy, it can lower the temperature on our anxiety. It can facilitate risk accepting behavior. It can facilitate engagement. It can facilitate listening, exploring different ideas. It can, it can facilitate feelings of confidence, even comfort in risk. And again, it can help me feel a little bit more secure that even when, I'm, when I've lost, that power holders are still going to use their power in ways that secure my basic interests. So distrust is on the rise, and it's a really bad ingredient for democracy. It can produce, when distrust is present in a democratic system, it can produce anxiety and heighten anxiety. It can put folks on the defense can produce this feeling that they're out to get me or my basic interests are at stake. And when I feel like my basic interests are at stake, what am I going to do? I'm going to act as if my basic interests are at stake and engage in self-protective defensive behaviors. We might even be inclined to engage in violence as a political strategy when distrust is present in a system. We might even decide to abandon the inconveniences and frustrations of democracy for more authoritarian certainty. We might even prefer strong unilateral action by a strong executive. And we might become really receptive to emotional appeals, appeals on the basis of fear and security and threat by demagogues. And some of us might simply isolate and retreat and disengage entirely from the system. So distrust is on the rise. And the question that we have to think about, especially in the US, is why? And one of the answers, one big answer to that why, why distrust is on the rise is partisan polarization. So if you take a look at this, this you can't see some of the fine print here and that's sort of by design, but on the top left there, you've got the 1940s. On the bottom right, you've got 2014. And what you're looking at is voting patterns in the US House of Representatives. Any quick impressions of what we're looking at here? What's happened? Polarization, yeah. So if you look back to the 1940s, and it starts to shift really in the middle 1990s. And in the middle 1990s, that's when you have Newt Gingrich and the contract with America, Bill Clinton's presidency. But you can see from the 1940s uh, that there are very distinct groups here. There are Democrats and there are Republicans, but there's also a middle ground where you see a tremendous amount of bipartisan cooperation to facilitate legislative action. 
And if we carried this 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 data to 2022, we would we would continue to see the pattern that we're seeing here, which is the fracturing of of blue and red into permanent camps where they they vote. Democrats vote with other Democrats. Republicans vote with other Republicans. There's very little room in the in between for bipartisan cooperation. Now you'll see a few dots in the middle there. And those are the few votes that in particularly, uh, particularly these days in the Senate that are up for grabs. But we've seen this overall pattern of polarization in Congress. And uh, two political scientists by the name of Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt wrote a, a really interesting book called How Democracies Die. And they say that polarization play factors really centrally in the erosion of democratic norms in the US. So there's a lot of stuff on, stuff on this slide here, but the, the question that we need to think about is why? Where, where has this polarization dynamic come from? And I can't offer a simple answer. Of course, the answer is very complicated. It's very nuanced. Partisan polarization in Congress is the product of a lot of different forces that are sort of mutually reinforcing and mutually aggravating. So I couldn't pick just one thing and say, this is the problem. It's a bunch of things that are cooperating in this vicious kind of way to produce this, this self-reinforcing, aggravating cycle. So I've listed up here just some of the things that, that political scientists in particular talk about as being responsible for partisan polarization in Congress. And maybe I just wanna emphasize a few things up here. Um, first, gerrymandering. So state level legislatures have the power to draw congressional district boundaries within a state. And, you know, if it, it, parties tend to use that power to draw those congressional boundaries in a way that stacks the deck in favor of their people getting elected to office. And this is a bipartisan practice. This is both, you know, Democrat state legislatures and, and Republican state legislatures have increasingly drawn those internal congressional district boundaries in a way that's created safe districts. And by safe, I mean, there's really no competition. They lean decidedly one way or the other, and there's very little possibility for a contest here. So over time as a product of gerrymandering, what's happened is that most congressional districts out there are homogenous. They lean decidedly one way or the other. There's very low competition, sometimes no competition for those districts. And thus the members of Congress who hold those seats face no real competition for those seats. And if they face no real competition for those seats, they're not gonna scramble at all to try to win over the other side. So you might find this interesting that in, in the election held on Tuesday, all 435 members of the House of Representatives were up for election. Only 64 of those races were considered competitive races. Um, closed, the use of closed primaries is another factor in, in partisan polarization. So voter turnout during primary races is quite low. And the folks who tend to participate in primary races tend to be folks who are more ideologically extreme on either the right or the left. And that results in both right and left picking more ideologically extreme candidates to appear on the ballot in the general election. You might find this one interesting too, a, a change in the congressional calendar and changes in social practices in Washington DC are also responsible for partisan polarization. So it, it, it is the case now that members of Congress generally fly into Washington DC on Monday they meet and do business on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. They fly out Thursday night or Friday morning and go back to their home districts. There's very little time. They're quite busy in those three days that they're in Washington, DC, but there's very little time now to get to know Washington, DC, to get to know one's colleagues in DC. Members of Congress no longer move their families to Washington, DC. So kids are no longer spending time together in school. The parents are no longer spending time with other parents and their kids. Members of Congress are no longer having dinners, bipartisan, cross-partisan dinners. They're not spending social time with each other. They're spending more time separately in their home districts. And Congress is structured to encourage that kind of polarization, separate lecterns, 
separate cloak work cloak rooms, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that folks who are not getting to know one, one another socially are also not able to sort of conduct their legislative business in a bipartisan way. We're also seeing these sorts of sorting processes happening in the American public. So we're actually physically sorting ourselves. We are physically moving to places where we might find like-minded folks. We're sorting ourselves online as well. You know, we're, we're picking and choosing people to follow on social media who echo our beliefs and the social media algorithms are feeding that preference to get more of what I already like. And so we're not exposed to things that we that potentially we disagree with. If we look at media patterns too, we tend to be fractured into, into at least two very distinct media camps. Some folks watch particular outlets, other folks watch completely different outlets, and it might be the same social reality, but we're fed different facts, completely different facts about that reality. So we're increasingly too, according to research, leading with partisanship. So as we self-define to the world, our social identities are increasingly defined in terms of our partisan allegiance. We typically increasingly lead with that. So why does all this matter? It matters in a really big way. It's, it's costly. This, this is harmful to our, our physical health. It's, it's quite stressful. It's harmful to our mental health. If we don't address this, this partisan polarization dynamic, we'll continue not to solve the very real problems that we face today. Uh, we'll continue to see a negative politics where campaigns are just based on just not them. We'll continue to see our fracture points in, in politics get exploited. And we'll continue to see this kind of high temperature, high stakes politics that elicits a similar high temperature, high stakes, sort of self-defensive, self-protective response. And democracy will continue to feel really, really frustrating. And as democracy continues to feel really frustrating, more authoritarian tactics may come to look more attractive. But despite all this, I see some hope, lots, lots of room for hope. So what you've got on the slide here are resources that you can build upon. So 86% of Americans are in the, what's called by this particular study, the exhausted middle or the exhausted majority. Folks who are to some degree or another fed up, folks who to some degree or another are ready to compromise, who to some degree or another are ready to flex a little bit to solve some problems. Now, I wanna, I wanna caution here. There's some reason to think that 86% is a little bit high. It, it also includes in here folks who are pretty strong partisans. So I said, to some extent, we're gonna see a lot of variation in people's willingness to flex, to bend, to compromise. But it's an interesting statistic that I think we can build upon. 88.8% .8 of Americans believe it is very or extremely important for the US to remain a democracy. That's a really good sign, I think. 70% uh, of Americans agree that low trust in each other makes it harder to solve problems. It's good we have consensus on that. And 65% of the exhausted majority, and this is really important, 51% of the left and right partisan wings believe that the people I agree with politically need to be willing to listen to others and to compromise. So all of these things I, as a political scientist, see as a tremendous sign of hope. These are things to build upon. So let's build. And again, what we're trying to do is to sort of change that pattern of polarization and change that pattern of really sort of hardened, congealed distrust that we see in US politics today. Now, first and probably most important thing is that we have to be patient here. From a political science perspective, none of this stuff that we've been talking about today is new. It didn't happen two or four or six years ago. This is a 60 year pattern in the making. So it's gonna take quite some time to rethink, to reshape, to re-steer. And we're talking about rethinking and reshaping our relationships, our political relationships, our social relationships, relationships on a really big scale. So we have to be patient. And I would also say, as we work on this, start with, start with a why. And I think the why is going to be particular 
to you. I would like you all to come up with your own why. And, you know, I'm a political scientist and I might say, I'm going to do this for democracy. But it might be more motivating to have a reason that's more, more personal and more meaningful to you. So it might be, I want to work on this for me, for my own mental health, for my own physical health. I want to work on this for my family. There might be a particular relationship in your life that is valuable to you, uh, maybe a friendship that has fractured over the last several years, and it's something you want to retain and work upon. But start with your why. And then this is going to be a, a practice. It's sort of like exercise. One workout does not get us in shape. Unfortunately, it requires really sustained, very small scale, repeated efforts something that we're going to have to practice daily on a very small scale and the gains will be invisible to us. And we're probably gonna be tempted to play a game of Calvin ball instead. But I'm gonna suggest that Calvin ball is not the best foundation for a democracy. Now you might be wondering what is Calvin ball? Calvin and Hobbes is uh, this just really wonderful comic strip. I think, it's a, I think he's six. I think he's about a six-year-old boy and, 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 and the tiger is his anthropomorphic stuffed tiger and Calvin and Hobbes together have wonderful adventures with each other. And one of my favorite adventures that they have is, is called Calvin Ball. Now I can't really tell you what Calvin Ball is about because it constantly changes. The one rule about Calvin Ball is that there's, there's, no, there's no rules. We don't even really know what game we're playing at any given time. And mid-play, the rules will change. That's really charming to read about in a comic strip, but this isn't the best foundation for democracy. It's, it is hard to read, and I, I could maybe make the, the, the slides available to you if you want. It, this is, it's fun, it's funny. Uh, but it is, do you want, I can leave it up for a little bit longer if you want to read it. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more the idea here. So I, I want you, I do want you to think about democracy as a game. So you might be thinking here about, you know, football, you might be thinking about Calvin ball, you might be thinking about soccer or, or basketball or Quidditch, whatever it is. Democracy is a game, but it's a special kind of game. It's what's called an infinite game. And I'm borrowing this, this phrase, infinite game, from uh, a religious scholar, actually, by the name of James Carse, and uh, another, another public intellectual by the name of Simon Sinek applied it in the business context for how businesses can create uh, really vibrant businesses that endure over time. But I want you to think about democracy as an infinite game. And, and we know already that democracy is a really big ask requires a huge leap in faith that requires a tremendous amount of trust among people because it involves a large group of people giving power to some and then hoping that those folks who have the power use that power in ways that protect my basic interests, that protect my basic, my basic preferences, my dignity, my rights, especially when we disagree. So in other words, democracy is an infinite game. Now, what makes an infinite game an infinite game is that it's ongoing. There's no end. There's no scheduled time frame to the game. The game is never done. The game is never over. Players enter and exit constantly from that game. And the goal of an infinite game is to prevent winning. The goal of an infinite game is to keep the game going. Bring as many folks as possible into the game and to preserve the possibility of future play. That's what democracy is, but there are lots of invitations to finite play. Now, what's the difference between a, an infinite game and a finite game? In a finite game, the goal is to win. And it can feel like every election, every decision in a democracy, it feels like a finite game. And there's that invitation to a finite game where the goal is to win. And it's to stabilize the win and maybe even tinker with the rules in ways that allow us to keep winning. So democracy seems to ask a really impossible set of things from us to win, to win that election, to win that particular decision, but also preserve the possibility of many future games. 
including among anybody else in the future who might play the game. And this is what makes democracy so phenomenally difficult. To win, but then play by the rules, in other words, to act with restraint, to build trust, which in it then enables future rounds of play. That's a tough ask, but I think it's also what makes democracy so worth playing. And for me, this really illuminates the difference between a democratic game and an authoritarian game. The point of a democratic game is to keep playing the game. The point of an authoritarian game is to get power, to win, to get power, and to hold power. So I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit in the interest of time. But I want to offer some ideas about what to do. So in a democracy, at any given moment, we're potentially playing two different kinds of games. There's that infinite game, where the goal is to keep the game going. And there's that finite game, that proximal decision, that vote that we've got to make. At any given point in a democracy, we're potentially playing two kinds of games. And we're sometimes going to need to decide which game matters more. So at any proximal decision, we've got to decide what's the longer term game this is creating. Does it fuel the possibility of a future game? Or does it undermine the possibility of a future game? And with that research on polarization, what I'm suggesting is that sort of the, to keep the sports metaphor going, uh, the drills that we've been running, the skills that we're developing, the training we've been doing isn't well adapted to that infinite game. It is well adapted to that finite game of partisan polarization. And so we've dug a pretty significant trust deficit. So what I have on some slide on the slides here and the next couple of pages are some suggestions that scholars offer for ways to rebuild interpersonal trust among perfect strangers who carry the power of democracy and make decisions that serve people's basic interests and preferences. Now, one of the most important things is that when we think about partisan polarization, we're not really talking about policy differences. I mean, Democrats and Republicans do have very different ideas. But when we're talking about polarization, we're talking about a fractured social reality. And that's the thing that we're trying to heal. So these are some things that we might do to sort of reintroduce the possibility of interpersonal trust in relationships among strangers. So we could change, our, change the talk, change our language. Instead of using adversary, I mean, instead of using enemy language or war language, use the language of adversary. Act like an adversary rather than an enemy. Fight but fight in ways that preserve people's basic interests and rights and preferences to preserve the possibility of the future game. Take a social media break. I think this came up last week, join a bowling league or whatever the, I, that would be horrifying if I joined a bowling league, but join something that invites you to meet new people outside of your normal circle. It invites you to have unscripted conversation about politics and it gives you practice in talking about ideas with people. Do something you've never done before with people who are new to you. Ask about the human experience behind the preference. Talk less, listen more. Engage to learn, not to score points. Ask about the idea rather than the label. And I like this one. This one comes from Danielle Allen, the political scientist who wrote the book, Talking to Strangers. Danielle Allen is especially uh, worried about the fact that in a democracy, again, democracies generate loss. Some win, some lose. And in a healthy democracy, you pay attention to those who are asked to sacrifice. If sacrifice doesn't rotate, if particular people are always asked to make the sacrifices for the good of the whole over the long term, that spells a disaster for democracy. So she says, let's import the habits of friendship into politics. Now she doesn't have in mind here that we're all gonna like each other. She says, no, disagreement contest is really critical in a democracy, but we can disagree in ways that don't threaten the relationship. In a healthy friendship, we recognize sacrifice. We might be inclined to rotate the sacrifice, give tough love when it's needed, avoid that self-righteous gotcha stuff, make a short-term sacrifice to serve the interest of the enduring relationship, we also have to get comfortable with nuance, uncertainty, ambiguity, and disappointment because those are democracy's guarantees. 
And another thing I thought was interesting, and this is in a book by um, Peter Coleman, who is a peace and conflict scholar. So international relations, he studies patterns of conflict and peace. He says, we need to evaluate where we get our, inf our information from. And I thought this was interesting. Where are our communications going? How diverse are the channels feeding us information? How diverse are the channels through which we communicate? And this last slide, because I have to wrap up here, is I think we have to recognize some of the limits of this practice. This isn't going to solve our problems, even if it gives us practice and the kind of conversation and interaction that allows us to have the tough conversations. Real problems and differences in how we approach problems will remain. The realities of democracy will remain. The gains are really incremental. We're still gonna have to advocate if we are so inclined for institutional changes to the electoral system that address the problem of polarization. And for me, this last bullet point up here doesn't address the toughest question of all. For me, as I was thinking about putting together this presentation, I kept happening upon this question, what happens when people don't play by the rules? You know, when they don't act in trust building ways, why should we? Unfortunately, I can't answer that question, but you can sort of guess my thinking about that question based on what we've talked about. And finally, at, every, at any given point, we're going to need to make an active decision about what kind of game we're playing. If we're playing that infinite game or playing the finite game of, of winning. So this is, again, uh, a long process of repairing some of the relationships uh, that have been damaged by partisan polarization and to rebuild those relationships of trust. But I think that list that scholars offer is a great place to start. So. Now I'm going to see. I'll repeat. Yeah, so the comment is that social media is really not a great place to conduct research. It's inherently biased. And I would say, you know, the, the, the business model of social media, it's, it is designed to, to keep a captive audience. They want you to keep coming back. And so they want to feed you things that you really enjoy. So the algorithm is designed to feed you more of the things that you, you know, when you scroll, if you slow down, that communicates to the powers that be that you're interested in that thing. So they're going to feed you more of that thing. It doesn't give you a complete picture of what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> I also like to ask if you spent coffee in your presentation because it was true. It's not right to have Yeah, absolutely. I could I could get them to you. Sure. I could get them to you. Yeah, there's a there was a lot of content, sure. Yeah, so the, the, I'm putting this in quotes, the editor on, on social media is popularity, that it's not, you know, it's not, a post isn't vetted by traditional journalistic standards here, that what puts something at the top of your feed is that a lot of people seem to be interested in that thing. And that's maybe not the best metric for deciding if something is newsworthy, yeah, or helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the question is about um, the fact that in the United States, we have two dominant political parties and other countries around the, around the world do, uh, do approach things differently. You might see a multi-party competition beyond two parties. The, the sh there's a long, there's a very long answer to that. The short answer is that it's it's the the structure of the U.S. electoral system that conduces to two large umbrella parties that contain a tremendous amount of nuance. So my my U.S. government students uh, this quarter are looking at a, a typology uh, conducted by the Pew Center for Research. And they, you know, they discover that the two dominant political parties contain a really diverse array of multiple preferences and interests, often contradictory within a particular party. But our electoral system is structured in a way that conduces to people when they go into the voting booth. They might have a preference for a third party, but in our political system, because of the way it's structured as a single member plurality rule winner take all system, they're sort of forced to make a decision about, about what to do. And oftentimes people decide to choose the next best preference or the umbrella party that is closest to my view rather than an expression of my true authentic view. So that's the short answer, but there are lots of things that we could do within the structure of our system to create the possibility of, of third parties or people getting their authentic preference expressed in a vote. So, you know, we could talk about ranked choice voting. We could talk about a lot, lots of different, different tactics. We have a, a group of comments coming in from uh, Facebook. Excellent identify me, especially now. So, like, is there some kind of group forming right now that makes it easier? So the, the, the question on Zoom, if I'm understanding it correctly, is is why is it so urgent to act upon this yeah. right now? Yeah. Uh, no, no developed democracy has sustained this level of partisan polarization for this long and survived as a healthy, thriving democracy. That, that's the short answer. You know, there are levels, there are levels of interventions here, as, as I suggest. There are those structural institutional things that we can work upon, but I, as a political scientist and as a human person, a citizen of this democratic republic, know that those big institutional changes can seem really remote and abstract and difficult to achieve. And so we might also think about acting on that very local, very day, every everyday, very individual level to begin to repair those relationships of trust that have been slowly chipped away at by all of those combining institutional forces and social forces that are fracturing us. But if we want to solve our problems, we must solve the polarization problem. It might, yeah, the, the, the comment was maybe we should spend more time going to, to party, to groups, to meetings that represent a different perspective and just go and listen. And that it might be uncomfortable to do, but I think that's a great idea. <laughs> 